into a quick series. It's just a two-week series on the book of Jude. In fact, you can go ahead and turn there. Um, I like to remember John, John, Jude, and then Revelation. So that's how I always remember where it is. That's all the way in the back. Second John, Third John, Jude, and Revelation. So uh, you can go ahead and turn back there, and we'll, we'll jump in uh, to that here in just a few moments. Hey, hey, what's everybody watching on TV right now? What was your go-to show? I know I just switched gears on you. What's that? Ten. All right, a little bit going on right now. Okay. Mountain Man. Mountain Man. The Office. <laughs> Anybody, uh, yeah, Shark Week's coming up, so yeah, yeah. Hallmark. Hallmark, oh, okay. So they're doing this Christmas in July thing right now, and I'm not happy about it, but that's what's on in, in our bedroom, and I'm not okay with that. Basketball. Yeah, basketball's on right now, the, the, the finals for NBA. We just got done watching all the, the hockey stuff. Woo! Go Bolts! Yeah, go Bolts! Yeah, it was exciting, exciting to see. Uh, my, one of the Hannah and I's go to shows is Bluebirds. Uh, we love Blue Bloods, and you know about the show. Uh, you've got Tom Selleck, classic, you know, guy. He's the New York City uh, police commissioner, and, and I just love him in that role. There's such great leadership that's in, in this. But if you know the show, he's the commissioner. He's got a son who's a detective. He's got a, a son who uh, becomes a sergeant, a daughter who's the assistant uh, district attorney there. And, uh, just a really cool show. But every now and then in the show, someone will get pulled over, and they'll pull out, it's a courtesy card. Right, they, they pull out it's, it says MIPD Commissioner uh, Frank Reagan Commissioner um, Courtesy Card, right? And that means they got pulled over, they know the commissioner, whether he's a friend or a family member, and they pulled out this kind of get out of jail card, right? Uh, uh, speaking of get out of jail, there, there's that in what? Monopoly, right? Come on, how many, like the longest game of life that you can play in Monopoly? Uh, I once uh, was at a lock in with some students, and we played a six hour game of Monopoly, and it was down to me and this one kid, and, and I, I wish I could say that I beat him, but he, he, he beat me. They cheated, though. They were teaming up on me, man, and, and it just wasn't wasn't fair, but I was gladly ready to just say, you're good. That's good, bro. Um, you can have the game, because I'm done. It was, like, so late, uh, but I'll get off of But if you go around and you get to that certain square, you got to go directly to jail. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go to jail, but if you're lucky, you play the game, and you get to pull out the community card stack, you get a get out of jail uh, free card. Listen, sometimes we do the same thing with God. Sometimes people will experience God, they'll accept Him in their life, and, and then we talked about freedom last week, and they'll they'll feel like they have freedom, but but then uh, they they abuse that freedom. They take God's grace for granted, and they use it in, in order to just do whatever they want, right? And that's not real freedom. Okay, that's only going to keep you bound. And I'm afraid that we oftentimes will throw out that grace card and say, oh, well, you know, Jesus, yeah, I'm all about freedom, and yeah, Jesus set me free, but, you know, I made this mistake, man, Jesus will just, he'll just forgive me, right? You know, and we, we abuse God's God. That's called cheap grace. It's called cheap grace. In fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this about cheap grace. He said it's the deadly enemy of the church, right? It's forgiveness without repentance. That doesn't work, Right? It's grace without discipleship. It's grace without the cross. It's grace without Jesus. The fact is that God's grace costs a lot. It costs Jesus his life. And it's going to cost us our flesh. It's going to cost us our desires in order to allow God's desire to have its way in us. Many live with this idea that, hey, you know, I'm forgiven, uh, you know. Through Jesus' death, well, we can do you know, whatever we want because you know, I'm free in Christ, so, so he forgives me. And we distort that idea. It's a perversion of God's grace. It's a perversion of God's grace. In reality, what we're doing when we do that is we are denying and we are rejecting Jesus. We are rejecting his teachings and his authority in our life. God's grace demands a whole life response. All of us. When we give our life to Christ, we surrender to I'm surrendering my life to you, all of me to you. Not just the parts that I want, not just the parts that hurt. All of my whole heart. We're supposed to love the Lord God with what? All of our heart, mind, and so everything. It demands our whole, after everything that Jesus has done for us, it demands our whole life in response. That is what true worship is. Music is only a part of it. Yes, we worship God in, 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 in the form of music. That's a part of it. But true worship is what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's
God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, bring in Jude here. I, I, I set that up for you as we talk about Jude. It's one chapter, so we're going to talk about it today and then next week as well. But it's one chapter, sh short book, but there's a lot of stuff in here. There were leaders at this time Jude is addressing. There were, there were leaders, they were false teachers, they were teaching the wrong things, and, and they were living the wrong things as well. They were using God's grace to give in, to indulge in, in money, and in power, in sexual immorality, and they were, they were abusing God's grace and their authority. So Jude writes as a warning. He writes as a warning to the believers, to the true believers, to say, listen, don't listen to this teaching. Don't follow this teaching. Don't follow because uh, the, the, they're wrong. They're, they're perverting God's grace. They're abusing God's grace. This is, cheap. this is not right. Don't follow it. Stay away from it. Stand out. Stand apart uh, from it. And don't give in to it as well. So Judah's writing this book as a warning to them. Why? Because God's grace demands a whole life response. So if you have Jude chapter 1, we're going to start there and, uh, and just start 1 through 4. At the moment, um, Jude, if you didn't know this, was the half brother of Jesus. He doesn't say this in the text, but he says that he's the brother of James. And we know James to be the brother of Jesus. It's likely that Jude would not have said that because he didn't want to make a big deal about it. He was being humble. In fact, he refers to Jesus as basically he says, I'm a servant of the Lord, Jude, right? And, and so he's being really humble in that, but, but he was the half brother of, of Jesus. Um, and it's likely that he mentions James, because if you remember, we were in a James series not too long ago. We learned that James was a, a prominent leader in the, the church of Jerusalem, and there was made up mostly of Messianic Jews, right? So Jews who had converted, had given their life to Christ, and now are beginning to follow them. And so uh, Jude, that's his audience as well, and so he likely name drops James here so that he could get, like, so he could say, listen, I'm coming from a place of authority. I'm not just some random guy. Uh, that's coming at you and, and, and trying, I, I, I'm coming a, in a place of authority. So he likely does that that way for that. So now let's pick up Jude chapter 1, starting in verse 1. We'll go through verse 4 to start. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So see there, he, he doesn't even mention that he's Jesus' brother out of humility. To those who have been called. Come on, look at someone say, you're called. Oh. Who are loved. Look at the other person say, you are loved. In God the Father, and you are kept. Say kept. Kept of Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith. That was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your amazing grace. God, may we never cheapen it. God, may we never abuse it, Lord. But may we come humbly to you as sinners in need of a great Savior, Lord, and empty ourselves, Lord, of everything that's not of you. God, may we experience true surrender today. Speak to us. Have your way through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Paul starts off, or to Paul, I'm used to saying Paul, uh, and then he says it, Jude. Jude starts off saying, contend for the faith. Fight for the faith. We have to fight for the faith. Nothing's changed today, right? The, 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 there's this movement, and, 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 and it's crazy. It's a little scary. It's moving in, especially amongst like younger leaders, this progressive Christianity that, that's creeping into the church. And there's all kinds of other things that believe in, and, and, and it's messing things up. It's not, it's not God's word. It's against God's word. It's just to make people feel good, and God's word warns us that that's going to happen. And we've got to, we've got to take this word and do just as Jude said. We've got to contend for the faith. We've got to fight for the real. The faith is what? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that he died and he rose again because we are in need of a Savior. Yeah. And we've got to contend with it. We've got to fight for that. And Jude tells the believers to contend for the faith because there were some wrong teachings and belief going on in the church. And his opening statements in this opening verse, he reminds us of three powerful truths, and I had you repeat them earlier for a reason. That's because first, you have been called. You have been called. Calling is almost synonymous with salvation. So in this context, calling is overwhelming.
common with God's calling people to himself in Christ. Like you think you made the decision to accept Christ in your life? Yeah, you, you may not, but it was the Holy Spirit's prompting you first. It was the Holy Spirit stirring you to say, hey, listen, I don't want to live this way anymore. Hey, I'm, I'm tired of going this same old way. I'm tired of running that hamster wheel. If you were here last week, we talked about that. I, God, there's some things in my life. I know I got, there's an emptiness inside. There's a hole in my heart. I don't know how to fix it. And the Holy Spirit said, hey, this is the way. Jesus is the way. We think we made a decision to accept Christ. It was the Holy Spirit that stirred us, that pulled us, that drew us close to him. And help us make that decision in the first place. You are called. You have been called unto God through Jesus. Our primary calling as followers of Jesus is by him, to him, and for him. You are called. Called. You, first and foremost, are called. Second, they, he says that, that you are loved in God the Father. God has a single relentless stance towards you. And that's that he loves you. He loves you. He loves you, and, and he loves us. And, and here's the deal. I know a lot say, well, you know, he loves me just as I am. Absolutely. That is the truth, but it's a half truth. Because, yes, he loves you just as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay the same. And he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die so that you could change. You are called and you are loved. And because of that, we cannot cheapen his grace. We can't abuse that grace. And third, you are kept. Kept for Jesus Christ. The word for uh, could be you um, as by or in. Also, the word kept means to keep watch over, to guard, held in custody, even. You are kept in Christ. You are held in Christ. You are watched over in Christ. Jude is declaring to the believers that we are guarded and watched over by Jesus. And he strengthens us and he preserves us until his coming. You are called. You are loved. You are kept. And that, my friends, is worth fighting for. That is worth contending for. It's worth conceding for. It's worth protecting for. It, the, the Greek for contend literally means to struggle, to suffer, to be under great pressure, to, to fight for it. It's a big deal. It's more than just a Sunday thing. It's more than just saying, oh, Sunday, we've got to go to church. No, it's, it's, it's a whole life response is what we're supposed to be given. And every day, our whole life. And we need to watch over it and guard it passionately. Pursue it. Why? Because people, they need the truth. They need the truth. They need the real Jesus. They don't need a watered-down, sugar-coated version of Jesus. They need the real thing. Because what? Watered-down won't set anyone free. It will, not set, it, it will only make you feel good for a moment. But it will not set you free. In fact, if you remember last week, we talked about getting that chain off. And I believe many of you got free. You got some of that, those chains off. But all the watered-down version of the gospel will do is give you a little slack in that chain. Yeah. Like a dog on a chain that runs. You ever see that? The dog run, 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 run. <laughs> that's all that the watered-down, that's all that cheap grace is going to do. It's just going to give you a little slack on that chain. Not set us free. Won't break that chain. And it's not so that we can say, hey, this is the truth, so guess what? <laughs> I'm right, you're wrong. You know? That's not what it's for. It's so that people can know and understand and experience the real thing, the real Jesus. Jude's original intention was to write about that very thing, to write about the salvation that, we, that everybody had in common, right? That was his original intention, to write for something much longer. But this issue arose, and he felt compelled to address it. Corrupt teachers have secretly infiltrated the church. Jude urged the disciples to put forth an intense effort to fight for the truth. These false teachers, they were sharing false teachings and ideas. And it's interesting as, as we read on, as we study this, that Jude doesn't even call out those teachings. He calls out their behaviors. Because their behavior shows what they teach. Their behavior shows really now in their heart. And so he calls this out. He calls that, 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 that those false teachings, those things led to moral compromise. And, you know, like, we've got to contend and fight for the faith, for God's word, for the truth. His grace is not meant to be abused. His grace is freedom from sin, not the freedom to sin. These false 
teachers, they were abusing that amazing grace. That grace that stirs us up. That grace that makes us think about who we used to be. How far God has brought us along. Those things that we used to have in our life and in our heart. That when we, when we sing even that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It makes us think about all that God has done in our life. And it's not meant to be abused or cheapened. But they were giving in, these false teachers, they were giving into money and power and sexual immorality. When I was in college, our, our professors, they used to tell us to watch out for the three G's. The girls, the glory, and greed. Jews then wanted the followers of Jesus to keep away. Keep away from these sins. Keep away from these beliefs, these teachings, these practices. And he uses a series of illustrations. And he, and he does them all in threes, right? And he, and he uses a series of illustrations from the Old Testament. He uses some different Jewish literature, Jewish tradition, to speak to them and say, hey, listen, some people along the way that you have read about and that you know about, because again, remember, he's speaking to Messianic Jews so they would understand this language and this history. He said, listen, there's been some people throughout our history that have blown it, and they never got it right, and they missed out. So he goes back to the Old Testament, talks about the Israelites when they, when they were delivered out of Egypt, right? And you can read this for yourself. We're not going to go into the, that part. You can read this for yourself. It's a quick read. But he speaks about the Israelites and, 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 and how, how God rescued them, but then they only, they only complained and grumbled the whole time. And how a whole generation of Israelites missed out on the promise that God had for them. And the whole thing that God was trying to rescue them from, they kept going back to it. And, and he uses that story. He uses some other literature from Jewish history, some books that are included in the canon of scripture that we have today. To speak to them, to explain to them, listen, we need to stay away from this because this is mess, this is messed God's people up, this is messed God's plan up for their life, and I don't want it to happen to you either. We are called to live a holy and pleasing life to God. We are called to live a life fully surrendered to Him. Again, God's grace demands a whole life response. Not part of it, not a little bit here, not a little bit there, not the parts that we want. All of it. A whole life response. Too many people treat God's word like a buffet. Now listen, I like a buffet now. I like a buffet, and I love all the options that you get, and you can pick and choose whatever it is going to feed your appetite at that given time. I can pick and choose whether I want a biscuit, a roll, or some cornbread in it. If I'm in the mood for one of those, I, now I know what you're going to get, Eddie. I know you're going to bring straight back cornbread. But I can pick and choose whatever I'm, I'm feeling in that moment. If I want fried fish, if I want grilled fish, if I want pork chops, if I want chicken, it's all there, right? And I'm making all y'all hungry, and now you're not focused on what's going on. And that's okay. But God's word is not like that. It's not a buffet for us just to go and say, hmm, this part feels really good. It makes me feel good inside. I like this, but this other part steps on my toes. I don't like this at all. It's not meant to just fit in our life neatly and nicely the way that we want it to. It's meant to change our life. It's meant to transform our life. It's meant to lead and guide us into holiness and to God and what he has for us and who he's calling us to be. It, oh, man, and, and here's the deal. I know there's a lot going on. A lot of people would say, well, this is just who I am. And yes, God loves you just the way that you are. But here's the deal. I don't care what your preference is. I don't care what your fix is. I don't care what your fancy is. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. I don't care what gender you follow. It all needs to be surrendered to Christ. So that what? So that you can be everything that he has created you to be. Not what culture has created you to be. Not what some abuse that has happened in your life has created you to be. Not what the enemy says. Not what anybody else says. What God says. It all needs to be surrendered. All of us. All of it. Because at the end of the day, you are not what you do. You are who you were created to be. And since God's the one that created you, guess what? He gets the final say in that. What he says has been written down for us. And that is the plumb line. That is the standard. And that standard doesn't move. It doesn't shift. If it did, it wouldn't be worth following. But that is God's word is the standard for life. And it's not meant to be picked and choose from. But the 
It won't set you free that way if it's not full surrender. We're supposed to get this in us so that it changes us. Here's the deal, church. What good is it if the church looks like anything and everything else? What, what, what good is it if the church looks like anything and everything else, right? Why, why would anybody want to come and get the same thing that they're getting out there? Why? why? Listen, if the church looks like the world, then it loses its influence. It loses its merit. The church should look like Jesus. I'm not talking about the building, because the building is just a building. Ain't nothing holy or sacred about it. You might think that way. There's a generation, I think, that grew up that way. There's nothing holy. It's just a building. If this building, something for God, please, for, for some reason, something happened and the building wasn't here anymore, guess what? We can still have church. We can have church on a slab of concrete. We can have church out there in the grass. It's just a building. This is just stuff. Stuff is not sacred. But people are. And God loves them. God loves people. He cares deeply about it. He sent his son Jesus to die for them. People are the church. You and I, we are the church. And we don't need to look like the rest of the world. The, the word for church in the Bible, the, the Greek is ecclesia. It's called out ones. We don't get to look like everybody else. If we do, we lose our influence. We lose that transformative power that is in Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. We should be like Jesus. That's what we should look like. When we don't, we have nothing to give people that will change their lives. We can't afford to get this wrong. The price is too high if we get it wrong. There's an old western called The Hanging Tree with Gary Cooper. I know some of you are probably familiar with it. And Gary Cooper's this doctor and he's saving people's lives. And in one scene, a young man gets shot and he's dying. And Gary Cooper goes in and Pulls the bullet out of the, the man and is able to save his life. And the man, grateful for having been rescued, asks what he can do for the doctor. Gary Cooper says, well, you know, I've always needed an assistant, so why don't you assist me? I'll teach you what to do. And when the young man asked how long the doctor wanted his help, Gary Cooper said, for the rest of your life. Because that's how long you would have been dead if I hadn't saved you. <laughs> and God says this to you and me. This is what he wants for the rest of your life on earth since he saved you. He wants you to yield yourself to his purposes, to his pleasure, and to his plan. God's grace demands a whole life response to him. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork. Some versions say masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do whatever we want. That's not what it says. So why do we do that? Come on, online viewers. Why, why do we do that? For we are God's handiwork, created Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're, we're, we're called for God, by God, for His purposes. And that's it. There's no need to complicate it. There's no need to convolute it. There's no need to mess it all up. That's it. A life surrendered to Christ should be a transformed life. It should be changed. There should be evidence of it. We talked about it last week. There should be evidence of freedom in someone's life. Paul, Paul said, you can tell that they're not transferred. You can tell that they're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. Because there's going to be, and he lists out all these different sins. He said there's going to be evidence if you are yielding to the Holy Spirit. You just have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, suffering. All this is there's going to be evidence, and, and, and there should be evidence. If we have truly given our life, if we have truly surrendered and given everything to him, there should be evidence of that. Because a life surrendered to Christ should be a transformed life. Worship team, you guys can come on up. Again, Jude doesn't speak about the teacher's teachings. He doesn't speak about their theology. He's talking about all their moral choices. The sexual immorality, the, the abuse of power, and, and, and greed. He talks about all these things. This, this, is what, this is what they were identifying. They weren't identifying in their life changed in Christ. They were identifying in all these worldly things. And, and if we're not careful, church, we can do the same thing. We can get caught up in all the wrong stuff. When your favorite sports team win, what do you do? What do you say? Hey, we won, right? We, were, uh, you know, we talked about the 
light, light, light. You just won. Stay in the cup. Come on. Back to back. Yeah, yeah. And we're all like, yes, we won. I see you, Julian. Yes, we won, right? Because that's our team. But guys, Julian, you didn't play a single minute in the game. <laughs> Bro, you didn't score a goal. You didn't get checked up in the board. I don't think you really want to. You're not missing any teeth. The grill's looking good. <laughs> but yet you identify with that team. You may have some other team that you, you, you identify with, and, and anytime they're there, anytime they win, you identify with it, and you're like, yes, we won by identification. But you identify with that team, and because they win, guess what? You win. In fact, we, we identify with them so much, we'll post online about it, we'll post on social media, yeah, folks, we go folks. Like the phone emojis. We'll, we'll, we'll post it, we'll talk about it, we'll stay up late, we'll lose sleep over it, we'll wear the gear, we'll spend money on it, we'll buy the tickets, right? Because we identify with it so much, you might call someone up and, and maybe they're an opposing team fan, you're like, ha, 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 we, we whooped your butt, man, you know? Because you identify with that. We vicariously identify. We feel good when our team wins, we feel bad when they lose. Why? Because we understand that we are related to the team by what? By identity. When Jesus died, guess what? You died. When Jesus rose, guess what? You rose. When Jesus comes back, guess what? You're going to rise and go be with him. Why? Because that's who you are. We identify with him. We must identify with who we are in Christ. Why? Because you've given your life to him. You have a new identity now. You have a new identity now. And maybe you came in this room today. Maybe you're watching online at some point. And, and maybe you're thinking that, that, that you're a failure. Maybe you're thinking today that you're a screw up. Maybe today you think you've messed up too much and you're too far gone. Maybe today you think you're never going to make it. Guess what? We've all messed up. We're real honest. We're all a bunch of screw ups. Yet the grace of God has called us back. Made us new. We're not too far that the grace of God cannot reach us. You may not make it if you keep trying to do it your own way, but I'm thankful that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You might be on the other side thinking that, that hey, you know, the, the, the false teacher said that everything's, you know, okay in your life, but deep down, maybe everything isn't okay. Maybe what we're doing is putting on a mask and we come into church. Let's see, God's grace demands a whole life response. It demands our full surrender. We cannot pursue both God's will and our own independent will. We have to surrender. We have to surrender all of We have to empty ourselves of one thing, ourselves, in order to fully embrace everything that God has for us. This picture here, picture of water represents our life and is our life, the water is everything that we that we put in it. And apart from Christ, we're full of ourselves. This picture of marbles represents God, everything that He has for us. And, and sometimes we come to God and we, we say, God, come into my life. And again, we, we like to we feel good when we do that at the beginning, that, that's exciting, it feels good, it feels good that we're not, it feels good on it. Sometimes we don't fully surrender to Christ. We say, God, come into my life, and, and yet we haven't fully surrendered. And so what happens? We, we start to put God in it, and, and we quickly learn there's not enough room. And, and it does what? It makes a mess. Sorry, there's a mess everywhere. I'll clean it up. I promise. But, but, but we make a mess, and there's not enough, there's not enough room. Come to God. We say, humbly, God, you know what? I'm, my dreams, my plans, my sin, my heart, my whole heart, my soul, my, my mind, everything, God, and I just pour it out at your feet today, and I empty myself, I empty myself of everything that's not of Him. So then now what do we do? Now, God, I need you to fill me, because there's this infilling that God will do, it's called the power of the Holy Spirit, and He will fill you with all of Him. Fills us to overflow. So now guess what? Now guess 